Throughout the history of the United States, antitrust enforcement has involved debates about the political and economic effects of bigness and consolidation. Congress largely set the broad parameters for antitrust law from the late 19th century through the mid-20th century by enacting the Sherman and Clayton Antitrust Acts. In this vein, Congress may take the broad approach of promoting competition between rival firms to regulate markets. Alternatively, it may choose the narrower approach of regulating markets in specific industries by imposing rate caps and similar regulations. In this video, we take a look at Congress's current role in the antitrust process, including enacting legislation, reviewing mergers, and delegating responsibility to industry-specific regulators. I think that there was a time when, certainly during the Teddy Roosevelt era, the earlier part of the 20th century, when antitrust was a major political issue. You had um, antitrust as a centerpiece of, political, of presidential campaigns. I think now it is, um, uh, it is seen as a necessary um, enforcement mechanism on the market, but uh, more direct regulation, for example, in banking, um, even though antitrust plays a role, I think that the finance industry um, and the financial regulators uh, the regulatory bodies are seen as having the more direct role. So antitrust is almost a backstop to a lot of industries, but not something that um, is necessarily foremost in the minds of uh, members of Congress. The most immediate way Congress can impact antitrust policy is through legislation. Legislative reform would certainly rectify any imbalances in merger or any perceived imbalances in merger review almost immediately. Uh, and that would be the most successful way for uh, the policy uh, to be changed. Okay. But through the years, significant antitrust legislation has rarely been enacted. As anyone knows who's been practicing, the antitrust laws have remained uh, stable and unchanged for decades. So they are not regulating the industry in a hands-on way in which they're doing um, in which they do quite reasonably with many other sectors. Um, that said, the, um, I think it's inevitable and appropriate that broad conceptual issues and directional trends are raised by Congress and you know that uh, is taken into account by the agencies. The last piece of I think standalone antitrust legislation that passed into law I think was in 1998, the ocean shipping bill. Everything else since then has been an extension of existing law. Some would like to see Congress take a bigger role in shaping antitrust and competition policy by writing entirely new laws or by applying greater political pressure. Well, I mean, policymakers can change this tomorrow if they choose to. Uh, Congress can go in and, and make a statement tomorrow that would change radically how we enforce our competition policies in this country. The Obama administration tomorrow can make a statement that will radically change how we force, enforce our competition policies. They can establish new guidelines, and this is, you know, basically uh, uh, explain to the world uh, how and why they're going to enforce the laws in a different, towards a different end. However, Bert Four, president of the American Antitrust Institute, the leading competition advocacy group, warns that turning to Congress could lead to a very different outcome. What did I see a sign once in the, the Illinois legislature that said no man, woman, or child is safe while the legislature is in session? There's a lot of fear uh, that if you turn Congress loose on some of these issues, uh, you may not be very happy with what you get. Right now, I'm not sure Congress could get anywhere on any issue. Uh, uh, but in a positive way, I'm even more skeptical. Recent history suggests that Congress's direct involvement in antitrust from a legislative standpoint will likely be targeted towards statutory antitrust exemptions, such as those currently enjoyed by the railroad and insurance industries. What industries do you see being of interest to Congress with antitrust? Well, the railroad um, the legislation to repeal the antitrust exemption for railroads has um, been of interest before. We've seen it introduced again. Um, there's actually a surprising number of McCarran repealers out uh, this year on the House side, both Republicans and Democrats. So it'll be interesting to see if they can reach a bipartisan compromise and pass something um, that both parties will support. I think what we might expect to see some more action in the next year, it would be related to the Affordable Care Act. I don't know how it'll play out, but I would, uh, if I had to guess, 
um, you might see healthcare insur insurers or other parties that are affected by these new exchanges that go into effect come to Congress and ask for some sort of uh, relief from the antitrust laws as they try to grapple with how with their new mandate under the ACA. In addition to its power to legislate, Congress can hold hearings to discuss mergers, though many question whether these hearings are effective. I'm not aware of any instance in which congressional views about a transaction affected the outcome. Well, it's many, I think, think that happens. And of course, when there are hearings on a transaction, it's a natural question to ask. But I've worked for uh, members of both parties for many years at both agencies. And I'm aware of no instance in which a congressional positions affected the enforcement decision at all. For example, while Congress will hold hearings on airline mergers, like the current pending merger between U.S. Airways and American Airlines, many believe these hearings do no more than provide a platform for elected representatives to voice their constituents' concerns. What you'll see in these hearings, uh, I think, varies. Um, oftentimes, a, a member of Congress's interest in a merger uh, it depends entirely upon the district they represent, uh, not necessarily the party they're affiliated with. So with an airline merger, um, there are some members of Congress that think it's great because um, it will uh, save two you know, homegrown companies. There are other members of Congress that think this is terrible because once these two companies merge, um, a hub that's in their district becomes superfluous. So oftentimes, as follow-up from these hearings, uh, members of Congress realize that they can't actually physically do anything to oppose the merger, but in order to show their constituents that they are acting on their behalf, they'll write a letter to the FTC or the DOJ. When we, we had the airline hearings the other day, each, each senator and Judiciary Committee wanted to know uh, of the CEOs, what are you going to do to my people, to my state? Are we going to continue to be served okay? The answer is, of course, yes, and that's about all they seem to care about. Uh, they're not looking at the big, big picture, and antitrust is not something that's on very many people's minds. While congressional views are unlikely to dictate the outcome of an airline's merger, Congress could have an impact on airline consolidation by looking into DOJ's airline merger review policy, which is a subject of debate among antitrust practitioners. Last summer, AI wrote a white paper suggesting that DOJ city pair analysis fails to account for all of the consumer harm that airline mergers create. This department typically looks at overlapping routes and asks whether there's so much concentration in an overlap that prices might go up in that market. That is a snapshot of today. What they should really be looking at in addition to that is what is the effect going to be when you have these national systems in smaller and smaller numbers competing against each other but the numbers are being reduced. A national air system deals with advertising and, and marketing and uh, pricing and can move airlines around, they can move uh, carriers around, so you can have a big carrier or a small carrier, you can have more routes, smaller routes, more uh, frequent activity and so forth. This is very dynamic and we, we should be taking the systems that are out there into account and asking ourselves. How many do we need at minimum? Is three enough? Is two enough? Is five enough? There's no way to draw that line solidly. You don't have economics that's going to give you an answer. It's a political kind of answer. It's political economics. And uh, it takes into account all kinds of things uh, that are not accounted for by the microeconomic static analysis. AI's concerns about the DOJ's airline review policy comes on the heels of the DOJ allowing significant consolidation among the largest carriers, which started with the Delta Northwest merger. Antitrust lawyer Ian Connor represented Delta Airlines in that deal and believes that the DOJ's city pair analysis is the appropriate way to think about airline competition. I think you, you saw a network pricing when um, the airlines put in place the baggage fees um, following 9-11, but that didn't alter the fact that they still competed against each other on DC to Orlando and DC to, to Chicago. Um, and they're still competing on service, both in frequencies and um, in price um, on specific city pairs. And then that's, that's why 
having larger presences at um, airports, the, the whole S-curve analysis um, that shows that airlines tend to do better where they have larger shares of flights because they're a more attractive airline at that airport because they, they can provide more service to more places and with more frequencies. Um, and customers find that attractive. It may not be because they have the lowest price, or it may be because they right. have the lowest price. Have you ever seen any examples of Congress actually making a significant impact in a merger decision? You know, I think that if you asked people at the DOJ and FTC, they would say no. I think that if you asked the um, merging parties, they would say yes. I point to AT&T, T-Mobile um, as an example of uh, one where the FCC uh, which um, really had primary jurisdiction over that merger, was kind of dragging its feet as to whether or not uh, to block the merger. I think that um, Senator Al Franken uh, did an amazing job on the Senate side of raising concerns, uh, beating the drum about what the merger of these two companies would do for um, wireless rates for the average consumer. Um, I think the DOJ arrived at its decision to oppose the merger independently. But I think the heat from Congress on top of the DOJ's decision um, made the merger progressively less palatable uh, for both the merging parties and their shareholders. When certain concerns about size enter the picture, Congress may determine that, rather than the antitrust agencies, other regulators will more efficiently or appropriately address those issues. If the focus of your inquiry is on consumer welfare or total welfare, then the agencies have all the tools they need to do that. If you wish to broaden the potential issues um, that one could look at in a transaction, say diversity of views or effect on the labor markets, not in a monopsonist sense, but in simply a welfare transfer sense, then the agencies don't, and they don't because the statute doesn't permit it as it is interpreted today. And I think most, if you never want to say all, but I think most would say those are largely political decisions which are much better left to A, either Congress or to more secular regular, regulators like the FCC than the antitrust division and the, the FTC, which really have no experience in making those sort of welfare allocation decisions. There are other regulatory agencies out there that can address issues that are not antitrust related, such as growing too big. So for example, the banking industry is subject to numerous regulators that if for, for non-antitrust reasons, for, for financial stability reasons, or for other reasons, the banking regulators thought that a bank was getting too big, they can step in under their statutes, or we could create authority under their statutes that would give them the ability to regulate the size of banks, but that's really not the role of an antitrust authority. What the role is for antitrust to play in agriculture markets? Well, first of all, I, I do think there are additional enforcement actions the antitrust division can be, bring. There are private plaintiffs' cases that have been successful. The division should look at those cases uh, as being examples of the kind of cases they should bring. But one of the critical I insights former Assistant Attorney General Christine Varney made was there is not an antitrust solution to every competition problem. And sometimes we should be looking towards how to use regulation um, to go and solve competitive problems. And mm -hmm. I think this is a prime area where that's true. And there's a lot that the division can do and is, I think, attempting to do in working with the Department of Agriculture to uh, improve the regulation of some of these agricultural markets. Um, and I think that may be part of the solution here. Overall, Congress has largely passed the reins to lawyers and economists in the government, private practice, and academia to shape antitrust law. While these lawyers and economists have a strong understanding of how antitrust laws function, some worry that important political considerations are being ignored. Well, I mean, uh, anytime you see a, a system that is mainly technocratic, it's the result of one or two things. It's either a result of people trying to avoid what is fundamentally political in the system. And that's what we see today. We see people basically saying, oh, this is really not political, it's, techni it's technical, and uh, basically using that as an excuse not to deal with what's uh, the political outcomes. The other uh, time that we see, the other case in which we uh, see people sort of using uh, sort of uh, technical frame to, uh, uh, and this is more effective, is when you actually have a clear political framework that you have applied. You have a 
clear set of political principles. This is what markets are going to look like. This is the minimum number of companies we're going to accept in any competitive uh, 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 market. And when you have something that is, uh, when you have these clear, uh, uh, clear framework, when you have a clear set of principles, that's a way, uh, a point at which you can actually turn over some power safely to the technocrats. But when you don't have those principles in place, when you don't have that framework in place, the technocrats simply obscure the fact that you're seeing massive concentration of power. Mm -hmm.